Listening to my life in poetry podcast may lead to revolutionary thinking. All the ideas brought forward are dangerous and vulgar. Sharing the podcast to others is advised. Socrates continues. Suppose that someone should drag him by force up the rough ascent, the steep way up and never stop until he could drag him out into the light of the sun. The prisoner named Sichach will be angry and in pain, and this will only worsen when the radiant light of the sun overwhelms his eyes and blinds him. Slowly, his eyes adjust to the light of the sun. First, he can only see shadows. Gradually, he can see the reflections of people and things in water, and later, see the people and the things themselves. Eventually, he is able to look at the stars and the moon at night, until finally, he can look upon the sun itself. Only after he can look straight at the sun, is he able to reason about it, what it is. A leopard then appears from the trees and grabs the someone who forced the prisoner named Sichat from the cave. And as they are both screaming, the leopard quickly breaks the someone's neck, carrying them up the tree where it rips them to pieces, then proceeds to have sex with the remains using the skeleton as a decoration for its tree home. The prisoner named Sichat runs back to the cave chains himself up because what the f- Episode 4 My life in poetry and living in the cave This episode is supported by betterhelp.com Use the code my life in poetry to get 10% of your therapy subscription Welcome to my Life in Poetry podcast. I am your host, C. Church. Make sure to share the episode with those who enjoy this type of content in your life. On whatever podcast platform you are listening on, please follow, subscribe, and give my podcast five star ratings. To further support the podcast, you could donate via my PayPal, mosesichurch at gmail.com. That is M-O-S-E-S-S-I-C-H-A-C-H at gmail.com. You'll also find this on the podcast description. This will help my capacity to produce more podcasts as I look to share myself, my experiences, and my thoughts on matters that affect our mental health. In this episode, we will look at one of the poems I found most challenging to write, though it looks really simple, The Cave. With the assistance from the work by Fred Cavaza, John Vavecki, Kidology, ContraPoints, Philosophy Tube, Professor Hans Moyler, and Marshall McLuhan, we are going to get to the meaning of the poem, making new ideas such as value-based communities, media man, and technopolitics along the way. Being a mental health awareness podcast, I will try to explain why the social media world causes bad mental health and what to do to adapt to it. It is my hope you listen to the end, be entertained, be inspired, and get a new lens to view the world in the process. But first... The 21st century is an aesthetic century. In history, there are ages of reason and there are ages of spectacle, and it's important to know what you're in. Our internet is not ancient Athens, it's Rome. And your problem is you think you're in the forum when you're really in the circus. My first interactions with the internet were filled with awe, yet I absolutely had no use for it. It was around 2005 when my mother got a phone which had access to the internet. It was a Nokia, hmm, I can't really remember the model. The screen was so tiny that names of websites could not fit. I will guess a name and add .com after and that is how I basically browsed the internet. I have a feeling that was what browsing the internet was. No one had read use for it. Browsing the internet was just done for curiosity's sake. I always wondered what I would stumble upon, which in some ways was more exciting than actually knowing exactly what to expect. I started adding .com to the names of some cartoons I watched. It looked promising, but it was so slow and expensive that I will never successfully load a page. After, I will hear my mom cry. 
Hizi games zako zinamaliza credit. Okay, translation. Eh? So these games of viewers are depleting my airtime. I'm not sure when, but at a certain point I had learned through the grapevine. And this is how we learn most useful things in the world of warptrick.com. I swear the site had everything. It was as if they labeled the internet so that you could find things easily. It was like Google had done the searching bit for you and you just open what you actually want. It is true I was mostly interested in mobile games, mostly the football ones and racing ones. It was typical of the age and the time. I then discovered one of the links written 18 plus. They must have known that this was like those huge red buttons written do not press in TV shows that use this trope as humor. This is especially for a teen who absolutely believed that getting to the age of 18 plus meant freedom, freedom to exist, freedom to be an individual, freedom to fuck, to do what I wanted without any knowledge of the literal costs of these freedoms. I guess I was just a hedonistic accident waiting to happen from back then. You should see me smile when I'm on vodka, walking barefoot in the city, not caring about the pending tetanus shot and a lifetime of air vis after I step on a syringe and pull it out because But I digress. After clicking 18 plus, I will finally find use for the internet. I think rule 34 was still a thing then, but my imagination was limited to just images of nude porn stars. I wonder if even they had a second warning to self confirm that you are actually 18 plus not that it will have made any difference because when you are a king wanting to pardon a thief and you put the thief in a position where they need to say what you need to hear then you will hear what you want to hear and you will pardon the thief i joined form 1 in 2008 and again through the oldest reliable grapevine i had of this site called facebook You will sign up and all your friends will be there apparently. So we all joined and as promised all our friends were already there. That time even emails did not have a demand for age. I know so since my email is nice and tidy. moseschurch@gmail.com. No numbers, no extra letters after you stopped using the previous one because you finally hit 18 and the age thing was quickly turning to an inconvenience somehow. <sighs> This Seems like a great opportunity to request your donations to the podcast through paper at wasschurch@gmail.com. The donations, however small, will really assist in improving the podcast. Every of the firsts for my Facebook was massive cringe. Let us start with the username Sharif Halif, which I'm so glad I changed to other cringe names that were not Muslim in hindsight. Not that I have a problem with being Muslim. Far from that. I'm saying in hindsight because of the terror attacks at Westgate Mall, Garissa University and Sit 2 which led to massive Islamophobia in this country. Did you know that in Kenya if you had certain names, let's say Adija, Ali, Muhammad, it becomes a hassle for you to get your identification card once you hit 18. This is done in the name of vigilance against terrorism. Yet the vigilance is usually targeted towards Kushitic people. But that is a can of worms for another day. Back to my first Facebook name. Up to today, I'd rather share my Facebook username Moses C. Church than the link because somehow Facebook will never let me forget my first username. As by the way, if you know a way to change this, please just DM me either through my email or on Twitter which is at C. Church that is S I C H S E H or Facebook Moses C. Church. I still have some use for my Facebook account or I still strongly believe that I'll have a use for it. Okay, uh what was my point? Ah, yes, yes. Facebook cringe of fast. I painstakingly scrolled to my first of Facebook posts and teenage search was just on another level of cringe. Let me entertain you with some Shadden Freud. So, the first post this was on 31st 2011 that first december 2011 so the post goes like this the 2011 song of the year was black eyed peas can't get enough full stop 
best hip hop was John. Okay, I know this is an audio medium and you can't see the post here, but here was spelled with a Y, E, and A, and was was spelled with W, A, and Z. <laughs> It's funny that I like the two songs 13 years later and it's so strange. I was not able to categorize hip hop under music or under other songs. Okay, the second post was on 23rd December 2011. So it goes like this. Life's so predictable. One day I'll wake up in hell or heaven. Again, audio medium. It may sound edgy teenager okay, but life's that is life is is spelled as one word l a i f s one is spelled as w a n and i will is spelled as a i and then apostrophe l l i guess you get the point i cannot take this anymore life in general but also reading through these facebook posts just two of them and uh, i want to be involved in a kitchen accident that will have my eyes fried to blindness Imagining this podcast episode will make me want to use kitchen knives as here, but 10 years from now really makes me want to just stop this recording, throw some bread and get to bed and listen to other people's podcasts. But so Facebook remained as the app for like another two years until the ever reliable grapevine brought to us Instagram. An innocent way to share the mundane images in our lives and well, I did not quite catch on to Instagram until late 2013. This is due to the fact that I was using a Symbian Nokia phone, which I bought instead of an Android phone about a year before. My decision making had always been dubious. I had no idea that Android was the future, though by then it was clear Symbian and Nokia were an old blind woman running in a corridor full of buckets. More or less, there was no way to find out, for me at least. This meant I was also late to WhatsApp, but better late than never. Once I got a phone capable of Instagram, I first downloaded WhatsApp. The grapevine had it that all my friends were on WhatsApp. And sure enough, they really were on WhatsApp. It is amazing how these apps just work, isn't it? The person who must benefited with my WhatsApp most was my class rep at Jake Batia. This was my first university. This was mainly due to the fact everyone I knew was usually in the same room with me on weekdays except on weekends where some of my friends went home because people usually wrote in campus and some parents would rather you wrote at home where the stench can be detected okay this is not a sad situation they're having everyone i knew in the same room not the routine i had always had my life localized up to this point thanks to being technologically impaired so that's how i got communication through my friends my parents would have sworn I was Guido Van Rossum despite my run of the male computing skills. God bless their hearts. Their confidence in me led to an obnoxious level of self-confidence that ended up saving my ass a lot of times. Like this time, uh, I was having sex in the bushes where snakes used to warm themselves on nearby rocks and you was truly and my lover girl were caught red-handed by a guard. But this is a story for a future episode titled My Life in Poetry and Falling in Love. Stay tuned. For now, let us dwell on the grapevine which then introduced me to Snapchat. And I had arrived, nearly thick. I was there. My timing was immaculate. Everyone was as clueless as people not solving any riddles. And my goodness, I took advantage of Snapchat. Or more accurately, I took advantage of my very attractive friend Juju who was using my Snapchat because by then, my phone had a better camera. I think, to be honest, I'm not sure why though. But... She used to take pics and post them on my snap. Sometimes I was also included in this post and I learned to Trojan horse my poetry. And at the height of this, I used to hit a thousand of views and at least 20 screenshots. On hindsight, You don't understand, I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody. Instead of a bum, which is what I am. Let's face it. This was not to be. Time just did what time does. Responsibilities change, crazies change, distractions improve, phones are stolen at the bus stage Ukishuka Matatu, and you find yourself eight years later telling Snapchat you forgot your password because 
Instagram added stories, Facebook added stories, and even Twitter at some point had stories. How could I forget even WhatsApp has stories? I could even see how my old class rep was doing over there and Snapchat became a glorified photo app where girls and sometimes me could take photos with filters with was an Ivy Vines and the dog ears to share on Instagram stories. And people of the grapevine were no longer there. It was adapt or die, but maybe this is an overreaction because I did not adapt and I'm still here right now trying to make a very long-winded point, but a point will be made, I promise you. The rest was a race for Instagram followers and TikTok likes, a race to see how many likes our experiences were worth. Democratic validation, if I may take this opportunity to coin my own terminology, democratic validation. Remember that, quote me, everywhere. And when every day is campaigning and election day at the same time, the wins lose their meaning, but perceived losses break our hearts more and more. Our heads cope less and less. I am not in love with self-indulgent metaphors, but they carry morals like nothing else. This is the age of anxiety for the reason of the electric implosion that compels commitment and participation, quite regardless of any point of view. The partial and specialized character of the viewpoint, however noble, will not serve at all in the electric age. At the information level, the same upset has occurred with the substitution of the inclusive image for the mere viewpoint. If the 19th the aspiration of our time for wholeness, empathy and depth of awareness is a natural adjunct of electric technology. The age of mechanical industry that preceded us found vehement assertion of private outlook the natural mode of expression. The 19th century was the age of the editorial chair, Ours is the century of the psychiatrist's couch. As extension of man, the chair is a specialist ablation of the posterior, a sort of ablative absolute of backside, whereas the couch extends the integral being. The psychiatrist employs the couch, since it removes the temptation to express private points of view and obviates the need to rationalize events. M.C. Luhan Welcome to my cave. These are contain. It will have you entertained. When I worry about my problems, I Google why my dreams are valid. I Google my dream home, I Google my dream dog and my full parking lot, I Google my dream wife with her friends, they are a package. I Google all this, I want to be Kanye. I Google why he had to be anti-Semitic. I Google why he is sick and why no one is helping him, but I still want to be Kanye, black genius and everything. I Google how to achieve this and maybe visit Dubai. I Google a good quote on hard work and getting money. Welcome to my cave. I can make my own reality. Welcome to our cave. Time to share with you my Google quote on Facebook. Get a photo to a company. It's good for Facebook. 
approval by strangers they do like on facebook motivate my friends and be accomplished on facebook talk of issues affecting the poor on facebook women and the gays need my help on facebook women still buying sanitary towers through facebook the gays could lose their lives on facebook and who will sleep with shouldn't matter on facebook the government should do better on equity irl not facebook it's good to seem cultured and open on facebook political correctness is frowned upon on facebook so maybe maybe poverty is a choice on facebook the women and the gays should not talk on facebook poverty is laziness on facebook to be a woman is to submit and gayness is an infection to get rid on facebook it is also good to see my man of god value and tradition on facebook i am traditionally open on facebook the image is the truth on facebook to fit in with all my stranger friends on facebook enough with the signaling on facebook i see my old classmate post on facebook post was shared from insta welcome to the cave the politics make their own rules welcome to our cave on insta my classmate was in dubai on insta He really visited Burj Al Arab he served by chipping a teach chai and mahamri it's on story so you know it's not a memory i want to go to dubai some day in reality like my classmates not for slavery they kill our women on the daily on insta you can book our hotel even in paris on insta i check the luxury rooms and presidential suits on insta they have fancy food even pools to eat Share on Insta. I keep learning from Mr. with the mastery, the guru on how to afford a booking to Italy. If I'm successful, I might even post my Ferrari. I just need to grind, hustle, pay 50 pesos to learn the luxury, and I might just start using hashtag FYP. Post photos with plenty quotes on successes on Insta, with the background of cars and princesses on Insta. Maybe I share one of them to my 40 followers. No, don't insta. Welcome to the cave. They live our best realities. Welcome to our cave. What's something trending I will forget soon on Twitter. Everything trending is usually more important than Twitter like the government poisoning people I arrive not Twitter not my government though they do everything right on Twitter hashtag on inside the states make the people on Twitter talk angry and pick sides to matter on Twitter they tell the government to get that shit together on Twitter it usually does but does nothing I arrive not Twitter I usually check in on trending things on Twitter and cancel people who think different On Twitter it is a great chance to gain followers and fame through Twitter you must insist your beliefs are facts on Twitter but I am atheist a political a opinionated my faith is very low for Twitter therefore I haven't had much success on Twitter it must be because I'm not a woman on Twitter It is a little easier for women here on Twitter. You don't even need to be beautiful. It's not Insta, it's Twitter. A little courage, a little ratchetness, a little ass, hashtag Tears Tuesday. It's Twitter. Just post some wet and I need a man to trend on Twitter. People are only honest, sad, and lonely on Twitter. Maybe I should change my name to Brenda on Twitter. Then tweet Hashtag Patrick is daddy on Twitter. Men and women hate each other very, very much. On Twitter, I almost forgot to paste my copied post from Insta or I just leave it. Maybe it's too positive for Twitter. Welcome to the cave. Kindness is not for strangers.
Welcome to my cave. I am a little honey from the streets from Crete. I feel like seeing nude people for no reason on Pornhub. Small white teen takes big black on all her holes on Pornhub. I just rub one out before the video is done on Pornhub. I really should not be doing this. I once read an ad on why it's bad on Tinder. Maybe I should try to get some love from Tinder. Man, you should really see my photo from Tinder. I look adventurous, attractive, and fun on Tinder. I'm also really smart. I have glasses on Tinder. I had reason it's a great aesthetic for men on Tinder. But if you are a woman, just be dumb and pretty or be pretty dumb on Tinder. I wish matters were a little direct on Tinder. D at why it has been a dry spell since tinder welcome to the cave love is now on sale welcome to the cave time to go tiktok it's still 0940 hours the day needs to be filled with tiktok they want to bumba beautiful people dancing on tiktok oh my goodness why do you do that for tiktok <laughs> It's actually really funny. I love TikTok. All these chefs cooking the foods on TikTok. The algo is my servant. God gets me every time on TikTok. I don't even remember to think on TikTok, TikTok, TikTok. The clock clocks on TikTok. Maybe I should try a lip sync for TikTok. I do not know many songs from TikTok. My video looks all weird now for TikTok. Maybe I need a better phone for TikTok, then maybe I will even go viral on TikTok. Beep, beep, battery low for TikTok, man. It's already 21, zero, zero hours IRL, not TikTok. Welcome to the cave. All life is in snippets, moments, and posts. Does not compute. Welcome, IRL, not the cave. Beep, beep, beep. The unit's meter is running red. I check if I really need to pay today. 0 0.9 units, that's enough for two days. I put my phone back to charge. It has been a long day. Man, I really need to pee and stretch. Is this a joke or what? Wait a minute! I scream, running to the piece. Peeing a little in my box as a side trip over. I finish, try to flush, but there is no water. I do not know why. I try, there is never water. I open the door. It is my only friend, Pastor Walter. He borrows some salt, match sticks, and says we will talk later. It is normal. Where we are from to borrow salt and postpone small talk for later. It is late enough. I will skip eating today. I just drink some stored water. It tastes funny, but I am going to imagine it's flavored. This way, I save unga and mboga for later. Maybe even use my 15 bob on betika. Just imagine if I win the jackpot 100 million mega. If tomorrow I skip breakfast and lunch, the budget will add up. I hope for the best, though. Lack demand driving a car, I can't stop imagining if I win the jackpot a hundred million mega, I will buy myself a dog and a life much better. Anyway, I am more likely to wake up murdered, sleep at night either by my other neighbors, thugs, police officers or any of my debtors. I'm sure Walter will just throw me to the river. I have no one who will take the bad news or even worry I do not matter. Most of my people do not even pick my calls, not even my mother. She got tired of me asking for money for supper. I understand though I'm big enough, she must feed my eight brothers. They are way young and their lives are yet to be touched by Satan anyway. I do not know anyone who can afford a burial in this area. The dying will really inconvenience world. The others will start worrying when my rod gets strong. I kneel to get back on my mattress like I'm praying to Allah. I switch off the lights, pull up the blankets. Thank you for the cave. I do not need to see what's happening. 
It's so comfortable with these chains, I love them. They have us hooked, they have us good and happy, dedicated to destruction, defying the truth. Reality is boring, painful, rude and dirty. Welcome to the cave. You make your own rules. Welcome to my cave. It is self-contained. It will have you entertained. Your life is changing. No. The poem The Cave looks to make a commentary on social media. The current situation of the internet is just social media and pornography and I'm not complaining. Actually, forget that. I think the current situation is just social media. The pornography sites have morphed into social media sites. A great case of this being OnlyFans. Even Pornhub allows for friends, comments on the videos. All adult sites have some sort of live stream which allows interactions and discussions. Academia sites have not been spared either. For example, academia.edu, a website which you can share your less than stellar academic idea, lets you know when someone has read your paper, even lets the reader tell you why they are interested in this paper or my favorite, SSRN, this is Social Sciences Research Network, which allows you to see the number of views and downloads on your paper. All of the internet has moved it to one large social media. Makes sense for hive animals to turn every site into a social opportunity, right? So, Fred Cavaza first developed his social media landscape concept in 2008, which categorized different social media sites according to their functions. He divided these sites into fast publishing platforms. These are blogging platforms, EG Wix, WordPress, and so on. We have messaging platforms. These are me your messengers, your WhatsApps, sharing platforms, which are your podcasts, your YouTubes, your TikTok, your Pornhubs, OnlyFans, Instagram, Snapchat. Uh, take your pick. Discussion platforms. We have Facebook, Twitter, Reddit-like platforms. We have collaborating platforms, these are GitHub, and then we have networking platforms, and these are LinkedIn, your Tinders, and so on and so on. This diversity of different primary functions of social sites has forced us to adopt different personas for each social media platform out there. We can call these personas profiles. Social media has become a core track of our different profiles. Most times, the fragmentation of our identities is forced by the site itself through the site's algorithm or in better words, through what the site deems a salient content that will hold people's attention. That is, it's usually measured in hours per day, used or watch time. Yeah? The site chooses to show this type of content to more people or what people in the digital space will refer to as the number of impressions. And just like a child learning which words are good and which words are bad, you are explicitly directed on the form and language structure that your content and yourself need to be in in order to enjoy the benefits of the sites. We could say the algorithm guides us to find the Nash equilibrium of acceptable content and language on the given site. One 20th century person who was worth all the hype, Marshall McLuhan, in his prophetic book, Understanding Media, talks of the now famous phrase, the medium is the massage. Well, the title, the medium is the massage, 
is a teaser, a way of getting attention. There's a wonderful sign hanging on a Toronto junkyard which reads, Help Beautify Junkyards. Throw something lovely away today. And this is a very uh, effective way of uh, getting people to notice uh, a lot of things. And uh, so the, the title is intended to draw attention to the fact that a medium is not something neutral. It, it does something to people. It takes hold of them, it roughs them up, it massages them, it bumps them around, and uh, uh, as it were, chiropractically. And uh, the general roughing up that any society gets from a medium, especially a new medium, is what is intended to uh, be indicated in that title. The medium of our time is the massage. Giving the argument that the medium through which a message is passed is more important than the message itself. He gives this example of how using papyrus to communicate allowed the Egyptian empire to expand faster while Mesopotamians writing on stone tablets which are heavier but more permanent made the kingdom last longer. In a more literal way, the medium is more important than the message. If you do not conform to the purpose of the site and technical requirements by the site's algorithm, you might as well not share your post. You find yourself conforming to form most times as a result. Say, I want to share this podcast to the various platforms I'm on to allow the most amount of people to be aware of its existence. The easy way will be to share the podcast list to the various sites, which it's mostly what I do so that it could not be said I did nothing to promote my work. Honestly speaking though, it is as good as doing nothing and could be the reason why it is only you, a gem in this world, who is listening to this podcast. And at this moment, please tell your other friends how cool they do that my life in poetry podcast is and share the link with them. Okay, back to my point. The best practice to share this episode will be to customize content for each of the social media sites I'm on. First, is ensuring the content fits the required form of the social media site by doing a little tweaks to the title and content to optimize what people in the industry call a copy. Follow this with ensuring it fits the restrictions of the social media in terms of the number of characters, display dimensions, color, sound, number of puppies required to be sacrificed, and as La Voizize says, and so on and so on. Second, understand the ever-changing privacy and copyright rules of these sites. Let me just take you through what a successful rollout to me will look like. After sharing the audio to my website hosting platform, I need to probably start with YouTube. First, I will get a few relatable stock images and videos from unsplash.com. These images will be used to make a montage that vaguely relates to the content. Secondly, I changed the title of this episode from My Life in Poetry and Living in the Cave to Why All the Internet Has Become One Big Social Media and Why That Is a Good Thing. Thirdly, I will overlay the montage on the podcast audio. Then lastly, transcribe the whole postscript on the video. This, however, does not redirect traffic directly, but rather just gets the message out that the podcast does exist if the YouTube algorithm chooses to promote it, that is it is an ifs situation, but I need to do that. After that, I will make some form of vertical video of the poem featured in this episode and share it on TikTok, Instagram Reels, for Facebook and YouTube Shorts. Then I will have a well-placed call to action for people to look for the podcast anywhere they get their podcasts. On Facebook, on my wall, I will create a graphic with a quote I find catchy. Uh, let's say the current situation of the internet is mostly social media and pornography and I'm not complaining. The link to the podcast will be on the description. On Twitter I could use the same graphic but make the background more provocative. Then find a way to use 280 characters to make it as interesting as possible and also leave a few characters for the podcast link. If I needed to also leverage Pornhub, I would probably change the title to African Man with Huge Black Cock Jacks Off while listening to the fourth episode of my Life in Poetry podcast. This has to happen, even for LinkedIn, which for the record I have to admit is the most boring site. First, there are no memes on LinkedIn, just pictures with words that have moral to the story. Second, nothing original since LinkedIn has originated from LinkedIn, not even a slight 
culture shift. Though to be fair, it makes sense for a social site built on the promise of getting people employed that no one saw left field of the Overton window looks like a great employee. Every post is a portfolio addition for those hoping to nick an employment opportunity or funding opportunity. And equally, to those in already great positions, every post is a justification of their life choices. Anyway, anything to make life bearable. Amen. Sorry for the unnecessary rant on LinkedIn. You guys are usually more fun on other platforms. Okay, now back to my point. I would probably share this rant on LinkedIn as an article named why LinkedIn is the worst social media platform. Moral to the story is that customizing the message to fit every social media becomes really tedious for a one-man show, yet that is what is required. I hope the detailed example given is a good way to give perspective and some appreciation of the amount of work required for promotion. This is after already taking a minimum of a week just to get the audio ready, not accounting for the writing. Though it sounds like complaining, I'm not. I really enjoy making these episodes. They do keep me alive. Each podcast made is to say averted. This seems like a great point to share a word from the sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp matches you to a remote therapist who is tailored to you by taking into consideration your individual preferences and needs. We are all from diverse backgrounds, locations, experiences, sexuality, genders, all these things that make us unique human beings with unique experiences and as a result need to find a therapist who we are comfortable with and they are comfortable with our context. Go to www.betterhelp.com stroke my life in poetry to get 10% off your subscription. You could also use my promotion code my life in poetry. If you wish to support this podcast in a different way, you are welcome to share your donations via PayPal. My account email is mosesychurch at gmail.com. Cause no pressure to do so. You being here filled my heart with joy. Back to the episode. The social media sites do reward content that fits expectations and purpose of their existence. In case you choose to use the sites differently, then your posts will get very few to no interactions or as it happens, these days, thanks to machine learning, your post is shown to very few users as it is less likely to keep the users on the site more. The social media sites become the medium which is the message, just to summarize the earlier point. To clarify how the medium massaging us has led to mass psychosis and why accepting the new world could heal us, we could start with an example of Instagram which has affected fashion for younger millennials and older Zoomers as they are looks maxing to look like their filtered photos online in terms of style and aesthetics. Thing ...in a very precarious modern context. Not only the vast majority, but all modern women will never meet that fantasy or that reality. And this is especially the case when we look at the generalizations and the lookism which subsume these communities online. These generalizations not only create unrealistic expectations for men and for women, but they also try to quantify unquantifiable things, such such as love, sex, making love, and of course what this entire video and situation is all about, physical and emotional or just personal attractiveness. And I don't think that these unrealistic expectations are a men's thing or men's issue or a woman's thing and issue. It is a human issue. Always expected to be photo ready, the colors are bright or purely monochromatic. The aesthetic is reality, the simulacrum is true, or as Kotra Point so eloquently puts it in her video, the aesthetic. The point I'm trying to make is that the world we live in is not a philosophical world. Think about Instagram. It's all about transforming your life into an enviable spectacle. If you cry yourself to sleep every night, who cares? No one sees that. They only see the show you're putting on. This is the same for Facebook, looks maxing, and filtered political ideas. The question is, what is on your mind and the initial design was for only close people. Then there's Twitter and totally decontextualizing everyone because of the character limits. And then we have YouTube with everyone having content to share. We have been adapted through upper Vlovian training with the dopamine hits from likes. A disclaimer, dopamine is great otherwise we will 
have zero motivation for doing anything. It just has bad branding as cheap pleasure from boomers and Gen X. But through this process, we become our profiles through the need to commit to an identity and opinion which has been socially accepted in our value-based community. Okay, I'm inventing this term value-based community to mean a group of people who come together because of similar value judgments. Those who have mastered profilicity become influencers. And rarely does the influence cross across different social media. A profile that seems authentic on Instagram seems like cloud chasing on Twitter. I would understand there is more to us than the totality of our profiles. The sum of these online profiles does not fully appreciate who we think we are. However, they dictate how most people who know us are willing to experience us. They limit our overton window, how we interact with authority, and who exactly is the authority in our lives. They explain what our expectations on love are, money, employment, and so on, and so on, and so on. The curated profiles in turn curators. Philosophy Tube says, We've learned something interesting here, which is that we don't just experience the world as a stream of inputs, we experience it as having functions and values and stories, if you like. The philosopher Edmund Husserl put it like this. This world is not there for me as a mere world of facts and affairs, but with the same immediacy as a world of values, a world of goods, a practical world. Without further effort on my part, I find the things before me furnished not only with the qualities that benefit their positive nature, but with value characters, such as beautiful or ugly, agreeable or disagreeable, pleasant or unpleasant, and so forth. Things in their immediacy stand there as objects to be used. The table with its books, the glass to drink from, the vase, the piano, and so forth. The same considerations apply, of course, just as well to the men and beasts in my surroundings as to mere things. They are my friends or my foes, my servants or superiors, strangers, relatives, and so forth. Martin Heidegger was a student of Husserl's. And he wrote about the ways that we experience the world when we use a piece of technology. His most famous example was a hammer. He says, when you use one, you don't even think about the hammer. You focus on the nail. The hammer almost disappears in your experience and you just focus on the task that needs to be performed. Another example might be a keyboard. Once you get proficient at typing, you almost stop experiencing the keyboard. Instead, your primary experience is just of the words that you're typing on the screen. It's only when it breaks or it doesn't do what we want it to do that it really becomes visible as a piece of technology. The rest of the time, it's just the medium through which we experience the world. Heidegger talks about technology withdrawing from our attention. Others say that technology becomes transparent. We don't experience it we experience the world through it. Whenever a technology becomes transparent enough to get incorporated into our senses or self and our experience of the world, a new compound entity is formed or, or what John Vaveki will call a psychotechnology. I'm on that in another episode. To use Abigail Thorne to assist with understanding our journey so far, a person who is becoming their profile becomes a new entity. We can call that entity the media man. The media man is not only someone's son, sister, father, grandmother who lives in a certain country, city, location. The new person is also their usernames across the platforms. The profiles become more static the more we use them and our opinions are seen as more permanent because they have been written down and can be referred to at any time. We can see this in cancel culture, examples where people are cancelled for views they held up to 10 years ago. Profiles make us less willing to shift our stances even in the real world. This happens even when we are confronted with convincing arguments against our profile's positions. We have to carry our performances from the virtual world into our true world, since changing the stance calls into question our very being, our identity. Existence becomes a performance for us, that is the media man. If 
you are always dressed in suits on your Instagram, you are likely to always dress in suits when going to any public event. If you are the party girl, this aesthetic carries all through your life and behaving any different from what the world expects from you may lead to people calling you fake. The media man cannot fail their profilicity. The psychosis sets in because of the gap between our total profiles and our total reality, causing a dissonance that we are unable to easily bridge. The dissonance occurs when the virtual world does not offer the needs we require to satisfy in the real world and vice versa. Emotional needs, love and respect are easily satisfied in the profiles. The media man makes a choice to elevate the virtual world as the self is more realized virtually. More and more, the real world becomes the technology that allows for the lower needs in Maslow's hierarchy. Needs such as physical safety, nutrition, sleep, education, health. The media man affected by the dissonance where social media technology as the lens through which they experience the world. So they can no longer see social media. It's the lens that you see the world through. The media man uses the real world to facilitate their profilicity. They become completely detached from what basic people recognize as reality. They know who stopped dating who online. They have opinions about social lives of people living continents away. And not like casual opinions, no. They go deep. Not like Kanye West is insane but makes great music. No, 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 no. More in line of a five-hour conversation of how and when Kanye West's marriage to Kim went wrong. They are members of communities revolving around their interests. Their daily lives become virtual. The real world becomes a stage for activities to facilitate the virtual worlds for media men. An example is the food served in restaurants have to consider color theory during plating so that the food influencers can take beautiful photos for their vlogs and Instagram and so on and so on and so on. The influencer archetype is born through this process. When profilicity becomes reality, the technology is fully invisible in this state. Meaning can only be found through the lens of social media. This seems a good time for a commercial break. Post the podcast, sip your tea or wine or coffee or beer or take a puff of your cigarette or even water. Take a deep breath. So far, we have explained how we become our profiles. For the remaining part, we are going to tackle how the social media lens actually work to create a worldview using the help of Dr. John Baveki. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. If you have any comments or questions, you can contact me via my email at mosesichat at gmail.com. You could also donate to the podcast via PayPal through the same email, mosesichatch at gmail.com. Also remember, you can get 10% off your BetterHelp subscription by using the promo code My Life in Poetry or my link www.betterhelp.com forward slash My Life in Poetry. I am Sichach on all social media platforms, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. If you would wish to interact with me more frequently, just hit me up. Sichach is spelled as S-I-C-H-A. C-H, I'll leave all this on the description. Okay, back to the podcast. There is a good reason why more and more people are becoming media men. To the persona in the poem, reality has become too cold. God has shifted. He only now helps those who can help themselves. He is no longer a God of the weak, but rather a God of prosperity. Family is shifting as there is no longer space for anyone who is not financially productive. The real world can no longer promise to provide the things that matter to the dignity of any person. The things on the upper scale of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The social sites have seen an opportunity to capitalize on this by giving everyone a voice and creating an environment where everyone may be heard. Some of us live in cities. We have to pay to walk in nature. For most of us, the last time you had a walk in nature was in a movie or on someone's story. And you are just remembering as if it is something you actually did. The last time we had a friend over was in our direct messages. The last time we felt love was 
when someone commented we looked fire on our Instagram. The last time we loved someone was when we stalked a crush, slid in their DMs and have been having great chats. By going social, the sites are allowing us to live virtually. It is no longer second order observation but rather it is second order participation. John Vaveki, a professor of psychology in the University of Toronto, raises an interesting point on what makes a worldview. Because I want to introduce an idea to you, this co-identification, because this is something you're doing all the time, right? You're always assuming an identity. I'm doing it now. I'm assuming the identity of someone giving a talk, and I'm assigning an identity to everything around me. Everything is right, has the meaning of how it's facilitating and affording my talk, and even you as the audience have been assigned a particular identity. I'm always assigning an arena and assuming agency, and they are co-defining together. That, that is an existential mode, to use a term. This process by which you are co-identifying agency and arena so that they fit together and make sense of each other and you get a coherent and functioning worldview, that's your existential mode. Co identification means that the identity of the arena is identified by the agent and the identity of the agent by the arena. John Vaveki states that co identification is something you are doing all the time. You are always assuming an identity and assigning an identity. For example, in my case, I am assuming the role of a knowledgeable podcast host and assigning you the role of my esteemed podcast audience because you have stuck with me thus far. However, this agent arena concept does not work for social media as the arena, that is the social medium, does assign us the role of user. However, we the agent cannot assign it a role since it has become invisible to us as we have accepted it as a tool. We instead use it as a lens to assign the role to other users. The social media arena becomes static by its preconceived rules and rituals. A second dissonance arises because the media man becomes unaware of the role they are assigned by the social media, or even that social media is a player as an arena. When assigned the role of the audience, everything this media man posted is no longer visible to the intended audience. When they are visible, there is an audience mismatch. The media man is sense relegated to only a source of likes and comments on the platform, a mere statistic. Not a main actor on the stage, not even a minor character, but rather just the audience. The media man is reduced to a statistic that is unappreciated unless they are part of a larger number of similar unappreciated statistics. This we can define as technopolitics the undervalued appreciation of one human being taking their time to appreciate an influencer. They lack worldview attunement as they are rendered a statistic yet they are a sovereign individual with hopes, dreams, opinions and a voice though it cannot be heard. Since the technology really gets the real world as a stage to actually exist in the virtual world as mentioned earlier, the real world lacks people who the media man would enjoy conversations with. In short, they are not in their same value-based community. And every discussion with the people on ground feels like a negotiation since we are no longer talking to a specific profile, but rather to the whole ego of a person. The arena does not fit the role the media man attaches it anymore. As a result, there is also no worldview attunement in the real world. The media man is forced to now accept the role of being a statistic assigned by the social media. They become the persona on this episode's poem, The Cave. Otherwise, they would have become less than a statistic. They would have become no one. They would be invisible. For those who become influencers, they burn out trying to sustain their voice lest it is taken away. This way, the whole world becomes sick. This is how social media makes us sick. This, however, does not fit in with what being human is or has been. We like to belong, to be heard. We like to contribute significantly to matters we are interested in, to ask questions on matters we like in. This arising absurdity becomes the source of the poor mental health statistics since the rise of social media. 
The internet has become the collective consciousness of the world. As we keep sharing our various profiles on various social media, one can predict the general direction of the social political situations and even financial markets by getting the general mood, I believe. With time, we will perhaps get better at augmenting our realities and achieving a universal worldview attunement. As for the medium and now, it is impossible to accept that the internet does exist as an arena which can assign you a role. Your social capital significantly reduces when you are offline. Remembering that every view and every like is a personal experience in the world can help in reducing the dissonance. Most people are not influencers online. It is just that the social sites show you content from influencers only, making you feel insignificant and lost. You are not insignificant. You are a human being whose action or inaction can change the course of history. I am sorry at times life is shit and continues to be shit and we are lonely even when we live in a city or next to our families. From the deepest point of my being, I appreciate you and I see you. Thank you very much for acknowledging my existence. Thank you for listening and be kind. If you managed to find me in my little corner of the internet, I'm really glad you are here listening. I'm trying to be part of a community that can freely have conversations about mental health and later have an actual impact on the handling of different mental health cases by being a resource for inspiration and knowledge. To aid this, I'm requesting you to share the episode widely with people who like the content on this podcast. I'm completely open to answering any of your questions either from the episode or even those which are out of context, just tweet me at Cchurch. I will always answer. If anyone wants to share their story or just talk or even just of encouragement, I'm open to this. If you like to just listen to the poem solo, you could check my YouTube channel by searching my life in poetry podcast. You could also support the podcast by donating any amount through PayPal at mosescchurch at gmail.com. Again, Moses cchurch at gmail.com there will be a double s appearing on the email so it's okay the donations will go to increasing the number of episodes per month and improving the quality of the podcast by getting some equipment and necessary subscriptions thank you so much for listening i hope you'll be here for the next episode and again be kind see you next time